Here's a phrase you've probably heard at some point in American politics, and you might have even been taught this in grade school. The United States is made up of three co-equal branches of government. Did you know that that's actually not true? Did you know that that is the last thing that the framers thought that they created? But everywhere you go, everyone keeps using it. The founding Fathers designed our Constitution based on Montesquieu's concept of the balance of power. We're supposed to have three co-equal branches. There can be no supremacy if there are three co-equal branches, by definition. Because we are a co-equal branch of government. Co-equal branch of our government. Co-equal branch of government. And they are co-equal. Into three co-equal branches. Co-equal branches of government. Congress is a co-equal branch of government. Three co-equal branches. Two co-equal branches of government. In this co-equal branch of government. So a co-equal branch of government. Co-equal branches of government. You have co-equal branches. Three co-equal branches of government. Yeah, it's everywhere. In fact, I don't even know of a single politician that actually knows that- House of Representatives. Wait. I do not accept, and forgive my bias perhaps as a member of Congress, but I think I've got an argument here. I do not accept the fifth grade dogma that we have three, quote, co-equal branches. I just don't accept that. For All right. So for the dozens of us out there who care about this, at least Maryland Democrat Jamie Raskin gets it. There might be a few others. I don't know. Oh, and of course, Donald Trump has also used this phrasing in one of his letters to Congress because who expects him to know anything about the Constitution anyway? We have currently a President of the United States that I have real questions whether he has read that document of the Constitution, whether he understands the basic tenets of three co-equal branches. I remember once my dad said that he always thought that the phrase co-equal branches made the government sound like some kind of Roman triumvirate than anything that the Constitution originally had in mind. And I think that's a good metaphor for what the effectual truth of this phrase is. But if you've grown up your whole life thinking that the three branches of government are co-equal with one another, you might be freaking out right now to find out that they're not. But that's okay, because we're going to go through the history of this nonsense phrase and find out how the hell this happened. But you're probably wondering, if they're not co-equal, then that implies that one branch is higher than all the others, right? Yes, that's Congress. Congress is supreme, or at least it's supposed to be supreme, and much more so than it currently is. Congress is the only branch that can raise taxes. Congress is the only branch that can coin money. Congress sets the salaries for the other two branches and itself. Congress can create or abolish courts and completely reshape the federal judiciary however it wants. Congress is the only branch that can add amendments to the Constitution. Congress is the only branch that can raise armies, declare war. Article 1 is by far the largest and most extensive article, while Articles 2 and 3 pale in comparison. Sure, the executive can veto a bill, but the legislature has the power to override it, and the president can't do anything about that. And, I guess most importantly, Congress is the only branch that can fire anyone else from another branch. That's the impeachment power. If this branch can fire you, but none of the other ones can, then yeah, this one is supreme. But how did this happen? Why does everyone think that the three branches are supposed to be co-equal with one another? How did this word even enter into our political lexicon? Is this even a word? Well, let's start with that last one. Some people make the claim that co-equal isn't even a word, because in one sense, isn't it just a redundancy? If you're co with something, doesn't that already imply that you're equal with it? Uh, not really. It basically means that something is correspondent and of equivalent status. It's weird, but yes, it's a word. But with regards to its being a part of the American political vocabulary, it's actually been with us since the beginning. If you take a look at the Federalist Papers, the word co-equal in its hyphenated form appears eight times but never does that word ever appear in reference to the three branches of government. In Federalist 20, James Madison refers to the United Netherlands as being a union composed of seven co-equal and sovereign states, and each state or province is a composition of equal and independent cities. In Federalist 32, Alexander Hamilton uses the word to describe the power to impose taxes as being co-equal between the states and the federal government. He does the same thing again in Federalist 34, referring to the co-equal authority with the union in the Article of Revenue except as to duties on imports. In Federalist 39, Madison uses the word three times to refer to the individual states as being co-equal with one another in the Senate, the total number of votes each state gets in the Electoral College as being partly based on the states being distinct and co-equal societies, and in cases of a runoff election for the president, for each state delegation to be considered distinct and co-equal bodies politic, as each state would only get one vote. In Federalist 63, Madison refers to the House and the Senate as being co-equal, 
And in Federalist 71, Hamilton refers to the British government when he speaks of the House of Commons as being co-equal with the House of Lords and the King in their legislative capacities. In fact, the only time in the Federalist Papers where the word equal is used with regards to the branches in the Constitution is specifically to deny them equality. But it is not possible to give each department an equal power of self-defense. In Republican government, the legislative authority necessarily predominates. And to make this point even clearer with regards to the Supreme Court, the judiciary is beyond compare the weakest of the three departments of power. Which should also tell you a little something about how incredibly powerful the Supreme Court has become compared to its original intention. But as Gordon Wood writes in The Creation of the American Republic, no one doubted that the legislature was the most important part of any government. When they were creating the Constitution, the founders weren't concerned about creating equality between the branches. They were concerned with distributing certain powers between them in order to maintain the integrity of their primary functions. Separation of powers does not mean equality. When the authors of the Federalist Papers talk about ensuring balance, that does not mean equality. When they talk about a constitutional equilibrium, that does not mean equality. To simply have checks and balances does not mean equality. The framers were definitely weary of legislative tyranny, but the checks that they imposed were not for the purpose of interbranch equality. Gary Wills has some good analogies for this. Think of the word balance as it's used in the phrase, a balance of trade. Each trading partner isn't making the same or equal amount of revenue. Same thing with constitutional equilibrium. Think of this in terms of something like our solar system. Each planet has its own elliptical orbit, but none of the bodies are equal in size. With regards to the way in which our government works, each branch has its own job and they are given the requisite powers needed to do that job without being encroached on by another branch, or being able to disturb the primary responsibilities of another. As David J. Seamers notes, each branch has equal constitutional standing. No branch is more legitimate than the others. And it makes sense that the framers would have thought of the branches in this way as a historical matter. The Articles of Confederation had no separation of powers. It embodied all three functions, judicial, legislative, and executive tasks, in one body that being the Continental Congress. So the framers had to make sure that the people saw each of the three branches in their new constitution as being legitimate and independent bodies in their own right, embracing the principle of the separation of powers. But we are so far removed from the historical experiences that made the framers view the branches in this kind of equality, or an equality of constitutional standing, that the word equal today has lost all of its original meaning. But even when considering who some of the founders' intellectual lodestars were, it makes perfect sense that they would have thought of the legislative branch as being superior. John Locke in his two treatises wrote that the legislative is a supreme power in every commonwealth, with the executive being subordinate to it. David Hume in his idea of a perfect commonwealth would have the legislative power be always superior to the executive. Montesquieu in his Spirit of the Laws never advocated for interbranch equality. In fact, he thought that the independent judiciary would be invisible and null in terms of its power while the other two departments needed effective checks on one another. Jean-Louis Delorme specifically warned against too exactly complete an equilibrium between the power of the people and that of the crown when discussing the British Parliament and the King as being legislative and executive bodies. James Harrington thought likewise. When a prince holds about half the dominion and the people the other half, the government becomes a very shambles. In fact, he blamed part of the cause for the English Civil War on the equal power distribution between the executive and the legislative. And just as a matter of the founders' colonial experience, of course they would have preferred legislative supremacy. The colonists were constantly battling the executive authority within their respective governments, and so preventing future abuses from the executive formed some of the core features of future state constitutions. So much so that as Forrest MacDonald notes, they may have erred on the side of legislative excess. During the revolution, the majority of the states created new constitutions that enshrined legislative supremacy, and only in New York did the chief executive have any substantial powers. Pennsylvania's 1776 constitution didn't even have a chief executive, and instead placed what would be considered executive powers in the hands of a small, popularly elected council within its unicameral legislature. It was normal for chief executives across the states to be subordinate to their legislatures. And as Forrest MacDonald writes, none of the governors had a veto power at this point, and only in North Carolina and Delaware did they have any pardoning power. At the Constitutional Convention, Roger Sherman of Connecticut said that he considered the executive magistracy as nothing more than an institution for carrying the will of the legislature into effect, and that the legislature was the depository of the supreme will of the society. Literally eight days before they wrote the final draft of the Constitution, the vast majority of the domestic powers we consider today to be part of the executive were lodged in Congress, while the federative powers, like declaring war, making treaties and alliances, or anything to do with foreign relations, were placed in the Senate. And the Anti-Federalists during the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention complained that the executive was too weak and dependent on the Senate. 
So there's just a brief history of the norm or tradition of legislative supremacy in America and a clarification of the use of co-equal in the Federalist Papers. The supremacy of Congress has always been right there from the very beginning. We're supposed to have three co-equal branches. There can be no supremacy if there are three co-equal branches, by definition. Otherwise, you'd have a superior branch and two inferior branches. That's just crazy talk. But why is this phrase so popular today? Where does its modern usage come from? Well, it's not really clear when it truly became popular, but you can find its sporadic use all over the place. One of the more important uses of the phrase comes from an 1834 newspaper, which reported that Andrew Jackson had delivered a message to Congress that declares the rights of the executive and of the legislature to be co-equal. But none of the congressmen at the time really seemed to care about him saying this. Only John C. Calhoun was briefly taken aback by the use of this phrase, but he didn't really go as far as his doubts might have led him to. Andrew Jackson informs us that these departments are co-equal and that neither has the right to coerce or control the other. It is not my intention to inquire into whether the view of the government which the president has presented to be or be not correct, though it would not be difficult to show that this conception as to their co-equality and independence, taken in the ordinary acceptation of these terms, would deprive the Senate of all its judicial powers and much of the legislative. It was used a couple more times in the 19th and early 20th centuries, but overall it was pretty rare. David J. Seymour shows that the use of this phrase was basically non-existent in congressional speeches and hearings from the 1800s to the 1930s. But then it picks up in the 1940s, really gets going in the 50s and 60s, and by the 1970s it's just exploded. Democratic Senator Robert Owen of Oklahoma actually pointed out the incorrect use of the phrase back in 1917, and to the same degree of irritation as me, where he stated, The law schools have been teaching thousands of boys to be lawyers have been teaching them that the Constitution established three coordinate, co-equal branches of government. This is a fundamental error, because they were established three coordinate, but not co-equal branches of government. The sovereign lawmaking power of the people, as far as they delegated such powers, were vested expressly in the Congress. Now that's a pretty awesome statement, but it's also kind of horrifying, because he's implying that people have been wrongly taught this concept for years, even by 1917. California Senator Bill Nolan said this phrase at least 30 times in congressional speeches in the 1940s and 50s. In fact, he used it so many times that he basically persuaded his colleague Thomas Kutchel that it must be true. And so as he stated in 1959 in reference to an Eisenhower budget proposal, So far as the President of the United States is concerned, he is a co-equal branch of the government, as my former colleague, former Senator Nolan, used to describe it with accuracy. And by 1952, Bill Nolan basically starts to undermine Congress's own authority when complaining about congressional deference to the Truman administration. During the past 20 years, there's been a constant encroachment by the executive on powers which do not belong in that branch of the government. There are some who are losing sight of the fact that Congress is a co-equal branch of the government. If we are not to abdicate our constitutional responsibilities, I think it is important that we constantly remind both the executive branch of the government and ourselves of this fact. And in 1959, when Lyndon B. Johnson was still a senator, he would also complain, Do we have a centralized control in this country? Do we no longer have a co-equal branch of government? The 1970s version of Bill Nolan was Wisconsin Republican Melvin Laird. And as his biographer Delavan Adda wrote, All those who worked for Laird could repeat in their sleep his constant reminder to them that Congress is a co-equal branch of government. Melvin Laird would later serve as defense secretary for the Nixon administration, and was just constantly using the phrase in his reports to Congress. During his last testimony as Defense Secretary, House Armed Services Committee Chair Edward Herbert thanked him on behalf of the committee for the full cooperation which you have given us, because you brought a new understanding to the relationship between the two branches of the government, the co-equal branches. Now as far as we know, this was the guy who probably did the most to influence our popular understanding of co-equal branches today, and particularly because of the effect he had on Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon's legal team loved telling Congress to respect the co-equal authority of the executive during the impoundment debacle and the Watergate investigations. Now compared to Watergate in Vietnam, or even the Native American student protests, no one really seems to remember the impoundment crisis all that much. So let's start with that one. To begin with, Nixon always had an adversarial relationship with Congress. He was constantly annoyed by it and generally saw it as being incapable of governing or setting any sort of policy agenda. The veto power during his administration was wielded much more as a weapon than with any previous administrations. But rather than take any sort of direct action in influencing legislation, Nixon was much more comfortable building out his own branch and asserting his influence by executive authority. And this attempt to bolster the executive would start to receive some pushback from Congress, and in particular with what's known as the impoundment crisis. During the late 60s, the Johnson administration wanted to pursue a policy of guns and butter. 
which was basically an attempt to keep fighting the war in Vietnam without having to raise taxes or make any cuts in spending. As you might imagine, the deficit increased considerably. Before Johnson came into office, federal expenditures never surpassed $100 billion. But by the time Nixon resigned, it was headed over $250 billion. In order to control for runaway spending, inflation, and generally just budget items that Nixon didn't care much for, he asked Congress to let him place a ceiling of $250 billion on federal outlays and to let him cut whatever funding he thought was unnecessary. Congress said no, and Nixon said, well, I'll just do it anyway. And from there we get the impoundment debacle. Now what is impoundment? Well, in practice, this power goes back to the colonial days. But it basically means that when the legislature passes a bill that appropriates funds for a specific purpose, that the executive can then decide that he just won't spend the money for that purpose. He impounds the appropriated funds and can decide to spend the money elsewhere or just keep it around in the treasury unspent. But this is where we get into a constitutional problem. If the law says to spend money on this thing and you're supposed to execute that law, but you don't spend the money on it, isn't that unconstitutional? Doesn't this violate the separation of powers? For most of American history, this question has never really been settled. Article 1, Section 9 states that no money shall be drawn from the treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. And Article 2, Section 3 states that the executive shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. But, and as was a common argument at the time, Article 2, Section 1 also states that the executive power shall be vested in the President of the United States of America. For a lot of people at the time of the founding, the phrasing of the executive power being vested in a president carried with it other implied powers than just those that were specifically enumerated in the rest of Article 2. Meaning that the phrase the executive powers is not just some abstract generalization describing what Article 2 is, but a recognition of certain positive powers that are inherent to and vested in an executive. And it did seem like this was the case in the first few months of Congress. When the first Congress passed the Appropriations Act of 1789, pretty much everyone in the Washington administration understood this law to mean that the executive branch had the discretion to spend the total amount of appropriated money however it wanted, and for purposes that were even outside of what the law appropriated the money for. Jefferson, in 1793, approved money advances to Santo Domingo to help prevent a slave rebellion among the French ruling classes, despite the fact that Congress didn't appropriate any money for that purpose. And this is also part of some people's interpretation of Article 1, Section 9, where they believe that it only means that the president cannot spend above the amount that Congress has appropriated. So the fundamental question is basically whether appropriations are mandatory or permissive. And this was debated in the early Congress, but the argument was never settled. Because on the one hand, yes, the funds have been appropriated by Congress, but on the other, and as argued by William Smith, a supporter of Hamilton, there may be cases of a sufficient urgency to justify departure from it, as if an adherence would prove ruinous to the public credit, or prevent taking measures essential to the public safety, against invasion or insurrection. In cases of that nature, which cannot be foreseen by the legislature nor guarded against, a discretionary authority must be deemed to reside in the president. But even then, in practice, impoundment would also be used by later presidents for situations that didn't constitute an urgency, and sometimes was just for purely political reasons. So the working assumption for most of American history has been, well, the president can have a reasonable discretion with regards to what he decides to impound. That definition, of course, being purely arbitrary. Though by the time of Nixon's presidency, enough Congress members thought that he had stepped over this reasonable boundary. But whatever the case, impoundment was really kickstarted by the Hamiltonians, continuing on into Jefferson's presidency in a much more overt fashion. Where in one instance, which is also a good illustration of the idea in practice, Jefferson refused to spend $50,000 of congressionally appropriated money for 15 gunboats to patrol the Mississippi River. This was because, as he explained in his State of the Union address, the favorable and peaceful turn of affairs on the Mississippi rendered an immediate execution of that law unnecessary. And what was this favorable and peaceful turn of affairs? Well, he just made the Louisiana Purchase. And if the Mississippi River doesn't form the border of your territory anymore, then you don't really need 15 gunboats on it. So he impounded the money. But overall, almost every president has impounded appropriations, sometimes on a small scale and for good reasons, at other times on a grand scale and for questionable reasons. So, now we return to Nixon. And what did he think about impoundment? The constitutional right for the President of the United States to impound funds is absolutely clear. I will not spend money if the Congress overspends. I will not be for programs that will raise taxes and put a bigger burden on the already overburdened American taxpayers. <laughs> In practice, Nixon and his advisors thought of the impoundment power as being essentially limitless. And after winning re-election in 1972, Nixon began a campaign of impoundments designed to end congressional programs in their entirety. The main targets were various subsidies for public housing, to farmers, and to local governments for developing water and sewer facilities. 
but it appeared that the net would be cast wider, until, some people feared, the whole domain of public spending would be ruled by presidential prerogative. Yeah, he was impounding a lot of money, billions of dollars worth, prompting Massachusetts Representative Torbert McDonald to say, I feel this process of arbitrary impoundment has contributed to the constitutional crisis with which this body as an institution is now faced. It goes to the very heart of our authority, control over the expenditure of funds. The simple fact is that funds which the Congress has authorized and appropriated are being prevented from helping the people for whom they were intended. House Speaker Carl Albert said that this issue is pitting the Congress against one-man rule. Basically, congressmen are getting pissed because they were promising to bring back the pork barrel to the constituents, but it was being prevented from reaching them by Nixon. And in response to the impoundments, groups who were supposed to receive their appropriated money started suing the government. More than 40 lawsuits were filed by 18 states against the government, and the vast majority of them won their suit. Now here comes the influence of Melvin Laird. During Nixon's impoundment fight with the Congress, and also with Watergate, his defense team would constantly use the phrase co-equal, basically in order to get Congress off his back. In refusing to turn over any tapes or documents subpoenaed by Congress, Nixon invoked the principle of the separation of powers and of the executive as a co-equal branch, according to one 1974 New York Times article. In another letter he stated, in order to protect the fundamental structure of our government as three separate but equal branches, I must and do respectfully decline to produce the materials called for in your subpoenas. The first recorded use of this phrase from Nixon goes back to at least 1969 in his message to Congress laying out his legislative agenda. In my view, the American people are not interested in political posturing between the executive branch and Capitol Hill. We are co-equal branches of government, elected not to maneuver for partisan advantage, but to work together to find hopeful answers to problems that confound the people all of us serve. But with regards to the impoundment debacle in Watergate, he was basically saying, stop investigating me, we're co-equal, or stop telling me I can't impound funds, we're co-equal. Now in response to the impoundment business, Congress kept trying to introduce a bill to control the president's ability to impound funds. But even in its own arguments, it was undermining its own case. Representative George H. Mayen stated that a failure to check Nixon's use of impoundment would destroy the co-equal status of Congress and would be demeaning the Congress. There is no awareness from Mayen that his use of the phrase co-equal to describe the two branches is demeaning his own institution. Likewise, when introducing an impoundment bill, Iowa Democrat John Chester Culver stated, the appropriate remedy lies not in the forfeiture of constitutional power by the legislative branch to the executive, but in the strengthening of our own constitutional capacity to meet our independent and co-equal responsibilities concerning the problem of our national budget problems and priorities. Or as New York Democrat Ogden R. Reed said in an effort to reclaim the authority of Congress, we must act promptly to halt the usurpation of power by the executive branch of government, so that the people's representatives in Congress may yet again exercise their proper co-equal constitutional role in the policymaking functions. And during the Watergate investigation, you had other congressmen also use co-equal to describe the situation, like New York Representative Henry P. Smith. Here we have a constitutional confrontation between two co-equal branches of government. Basically, by this point, Congress had internalized its own co-equal status with the executive without even knowing it, completely undermining its superior authority. Now, Congress would ultimately respond to the impoundment debacle by passing the Congressional Budget and Impoundment Control Act of 1974. And you might recall that in 2019, according to the U.S. Government Accountability Office, President Trump violated the Impoundment Control Act when he refused to send Ukraine its congressionally appropriated military aid. But anyway, once Gerald Ford took over the presidency, he basically ensured that the entire country would hear this nonsense phrase. I know well the co-equal role of the Congress in our constitutional process. And from this point on, co-equal branches is all over the place in court opinions, speeches, in journalism, on TV, in our schools, everywhere. But um, I came here with the same idea that uh, we're co-equal branches of the government. Uh, they've got their problems. Uh. Bill Clinton's defense team during his impeachment used it as well, saying that our framers wisely gave us a constitutional system of checks and balances with three co-equal branches. Removing the president on these facts would substantially alter the delicate constitutional balance and move us closer to a quasi-parliamentary system. And if you head over to the Supreme Court's website right now, you'll see in its own description of itself, this building, majestic in size and rich in ornamentation, serves as both home to the court and the manifest symbol of its importance as a co-equal, independent branch of government. Wrong, wrong, wrong. I won't bore you with more examples of its use, so let's get on to the next section. Why is the continued use of this phrase something that's bad for our government? What does it really matter if the government, or the people for that matter, believe that the government consists of three co-equal branches? Well, let's start with why politicians use the phrase. 
In one sense, it allows the most ambitious among them to make the claim that they are being denied greater powers than is enumerated, and it allows the laziest among them to avoid any culpability for bad decisions. Basically, we're a co-equal branch, I have just as much power as them, or Whoa, we're a co-equal branch. We can't be responsible for that horrible decision. He made it. It's a phrase used either to deny responsibility or acquire more power and rally your allies. Which, you're supposed to be very skeptical of people who want more power. Power corrupts people. It's also an interesting point that most people who use this phrase never really care to explain what it means in any meaningful sense. The phrase is typically used in ways that admit of no practical test that might confirm or deny its existence. Its use by people on opposite sides of major controversies demonstrates that it does not effectively indicate what political course to follow at any given time. It is a phrase that is at once virtually meaningless, but also filled with consequence. It justifies a kind of politics where governance is extremely difficult. If you're consistently working under the mindset that the branches are co-equal with one another, you're just going to promote gridlock. This is particularly a problem for Congress, because this is where everything starts. The executive and judiciary don't have much to do if there aren't laws for it to execute or to adjudicate. If you're just going to talk about how equal you are, rather than assert your dominance, then you're not even going to attempt to impose yourself or make any significant moves at creating new legislation. Which is partly why so many people feel like Congress doesn't do anything today. And is also why politicians spend so much time trying to be cable news pundits instead of doing their job. Yuval Levin notes in A Time to Build that Congress is weak because its members want it to be weak. Their behavior and priorities reflect a peculiar lack of institutional ambition. This is the complete opposite of an institution extending the sphere of its activity and drawing all power into its impetuous vortex, as Madison wrote about it in Federalist 48. Many members of Congress have come to understand themselves most fundamentally as players in a larger cultural ecosystem, the point of which is not legislating or governing, but rather a kind of performative outrage for a partisan audience. This is what you see with people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Matt Gates who prioritize their social media following by trolling and cultivating anger from the most obnoxious and susceptible members of both parties. In other words, they're not doing their jobs as legislators. They're filling in as pundits who would much rather be on TYT or Fox News. They act like outsiders commenting on Congress rather than like insiders participating in it. Such members try to gain status and prominence by endlessly scorning the institution they work so hard to enter. The advent of C-SPAN in 1979, for all its use even in this video, also hasn't been very helpful in this regard. While it might have sounded nice at the time to be able to see what's going on in Congress, in practice it just means that our legislators will be performing even more for the cameras. Transparency is good, but when there's too much, you actually can't do your job because you will always be aware of the people watching you. You will note that at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, the framers deliberately locked all the doors and closed all the windows to prevent people from being able to hear what was going on in there and spreading nonsense rumors. You need an enclosed space to deliberate and debate. You need privacy. You need a space to ask questions without having to be worried that the very act of asking a question will make you look stupid to any of your constituents or to some partisan on the other side looking for any opportunity to display your incompetence. Most congressmen don't know a whole lot of things. They have to ask questions. When you get elected, you don't enter the building and suddenly get infused with all the knowledge in the known universe, as some people make it sound like they do. Most people are ignorant. They are not experts on the minutia of law. They need help. They need assistance. They need to ask questions and work things out, make deals, bargain with one another. And this gets done a lot better with a bit of privacy. But since they don't really have that right now, and hardly anyone in Congress actually wants to do the job of legislating over hosting podcasts with this guy, or showing off how well they can cook on a live stream, or talking about how much their political opponents are evil on TV, it gives them more incentive to proclaim the co-equal status of the branches and abdicate any responsibility, the use of which, as David Seamers notes, has only been increasing under the Trump presidency. Another reason why this phrase is bad for people to believe is that what you're essentially saying is that if any two branches disagree with another branch, then by the magic of majorities, it just cancels out the decision of the other branch. This is something that Newt Gingrich peddled in 2011. It's always two out of three, he says. If the Congress and the court say the president is wrong, in the end, the president would lose. And if the president and the court agreed, the Congress loses. Okay, please point me to the specific section of the Constitution that says that two branches can cancel out decisions made by another newt. You're not going to find it. But, but I, th I think the legislative branch, when it wants to, is the co-equal of the executive branch. The Clinton administration also said the same thing on their White House page. 
Because each branch has both individual and shared powers, no branch has more authority than the other two, and each is accountable to the others. This checks and balances system means that the balance of power in our government remains steady. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And the American people are so much worse off for being made to believe in this nonsense phrase. George Orwell wrote how language can be used to corrupt thought, writing in his essay Politics in the English Language that the constant repetition of a certain word or phrase desensitizes or numbs you from what you are hearing or reading, preventing you from thinking critically. And then the word or phrase just keeps getting used until it becomes completely normalized. An effect can become a cause, reinforcing the original cause and producing the same effect in an intensified form, and so on indefinitely. A man may take to drink because he feels himself to be a failure, and then fail all the more completely because he drinks. It is rather the same thing that is happening to the English language. It becomes ugly and inaccurate because our thoughts are foolish, but the slovenliness of our language makes it easier for us to have foolish thoughts. But if thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. A bad usage can spread by tradition and imitation even among people who should and do know better. We've been saying this phrase so many times that we're unconscious to the fact that it has any meaning. To our ears, co-equal branches basically signifies that something comports with good government or something, without having to think about what its practical meaning is. It just sounds good to us because its repeated use in political speak gives an aura of legitimacy about whatever it is that's being talked about. But in another sense, the use of this phrase also seems to be concomitant with the increase in presidential power since the Constitution was ratified. George Washington was very cautious about being overly brazen in his role as executive, lest he trigger the legislative branch. And for most of the 19th century, Congress was the star of the show, as was its intended role. Which I also think is part of the reason why people literally have no idea who was president during this time. After Andrew Jackson, there's like a blank spot in most people's knowledge. The same also seems to be true for the space between Lincoln and, I guess, William McKinley. And this is mostly consummate with the level of imposition that each of these presidents in the blackout zone placed on the executive. I mean, some of the most important figures alive in the 19th century were all involved in one form or another in the Congress. John C. Calhoun, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, the Great Triumvirate. And right up to the end of the Civil War and the entry of the Radical Republicans, legislative supremacy was the norm. But by the turn of the century, there was a new balance of power between Congress and the executive. Both branches seemed to be more energized, and nearly all the presidents from McKinley onward took on way more powers than had any of their predecessors since Lincoln and Jefferson. Theodore Roosevelt really started the trend of changing Americans' expectations for the presidency and what it could do legislatively, even though for the most part, Roosevelt was just taking credit for legislation that others sponsored, or simply said that something was a great progressive reform when it really wasn't, like the Elkins Act of 1903, which was advertised as a punishment for the railroads, when in reality it protected them from competition and helped to buttress the railroad cartel. Actually, Roosevelt was so close to the railroad tycoons that they called him their best friend. As a side note, sometime in the near future, I expect most historians to start realizing that the progressive era wasn't nearly as good as it's been made out to be. There's a lot of problems with that time period, and the recent removal of Woodrow Wilson's name from the Princeton Public Policy School is a step forward in that regard. Also, I really don't like the cult of Teddy that so many people embody. Anyway, Theodore Roosevelt would also write in his autobiography that the executive power was limited only by specific restrictions and prohibitions appearing in the Constitution or imposed by the Congress under its constitutional powers. I declined to adopt the view that what was imperatively necessary for the nation could not be done by the President unless he could find some specific authorization to do it. I acted for the public welfare. I acted for the common well-being of all our people, whenever and in whatever manner was necessary, unless prevented by direct constitutional or legislative prohibition. And Woodrow Wilson would really be the first to take advantage of the new presidential posture that Theodore had set up. He thought that the president must be prime minister, as much concerned with the guidance of legislation as with the just and orderly execution of law, and he's the spokesman of the nation in everything. After his election, when the Democratic national chairman came to talk to him about making appointments, Wilson put him down by saying, Before we proceed, I wish it clearly understood that I owe you nothing. Remember that God ordained that I should be the next president of the United States. Woodrow Wilson was a very stubborn and vain person. And once FDR came into power, the government was essentially ruled by executive supremacy throughout his tenure, with some exceptions. Major laws were passed within days of their being proposed by FDR and his brain trust of advisors. His legacy is the main reason why we look to the presidency as the cure for all our problems today. And by the 1950s, it was becoming more and more clear that the executive was for all practical purposes working as legislator in chief. LBJ Nixon ingrained this even further. So much so that it would be around Nixon's presidency that Congress would finally start to become more assertive in flexing its powers over the executive. Their success in the Watergate investigation and the pushback on impoundment carried on their more bullish attitude through the Carter administration. 
But internally, the Congress was just a bureaucratic mess. I mean, the amount of staff members needed to operate Congress just exploded. People still don't seem to understand that it's not the congressmen who run DC, it's their staff members, interns. And while Congress would still hold on to some of its powers, it's never really regained its full strength since its apex in the 19th century. And as we mentioned earlier, because Congress has been so gridlocked in the last few decades, it's no surprise to see the president act on his own by means of executive orders, bureaucratic rule, and executive agreements, hardly any of which are styled by Congress. But the growth and the importance of the presidency, aside from historical circumstances and a lack of willingness on the part of Congress to assert itself, is also due in part to technology. Mass printing, photography, magazines, theaters, radio, TV, the internet, and especially the increasingly tight connection between the press and the presidency has given it a certain aura and created a kind of appetite among the people to be even closer to the president and to see their president doing more, more of anything. And in turn, the more the presidency has siphoned off powers from the legislative branch and the more that the legislative branch is content with the siphoning and being lazy, with the result being that all three branches now think of themselves as being co-equal with one another. And as a very possible consequence of this is the sclerotic government we've had for the last couple of decades and the seeming inability of either the legislative or the executive to really be all that effective. So, co-equal branches. We have got to put an end to this myth. I'm looking at you, stop it. Stop this nonsense that we're hearing these days that Congress is a co-equal branch of government. It's not co-equal, it's superior. All of you, tell your friends, tell your family, tell the whole world, Congress is supreme. That's the way our government was designed and that's the way it's supposed to work. Do not let anyone off the hook for using this phrase in reference to the three branches. It is a violation of the Constitution. As George Orwell wrote, This invasion of one's mind by ready-made phrases can only be prevented if one is constantly on guard against them, and every such phrase anesthetizes a portion of one's brain. Listen to what people are saying. Listen closely. Tell your congressman to stop being lazy and to stop abrogating their powers to the executive. Stop voting for presidents who want to increase executive power. Demand that Congress regain its powers and do its job. And for the love of God, stop calling them co-equal branches. <laughs>